the program now. Um, and again, really fortunate to have um, such a high calibre of speakers um, this uh, today, and that, that continues this afternoon. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Francis Cook. Uh, so Francis is the National Manager of Knowledge Research and Policy for the Butterfly Foundation. So I'm sure many of you um, here would have heard of the Butterfly Foundation, um, but if not, um, that, that's something that I'm sure Francis will cover within the presentation. Francis has over 17 years experience in service delivery around research and policy across government, non-government and social service sectors. She has a particular interest in mental health, community development and child welfare. And she's also been the national manager for the National Eating Disorders Collaboration, or the NEDC, for the last five years. The Butterfly Foundation represents all people affected by eating disorders and neg neg negative body image. Um, and they run a range of programs nationally, including school prevention initiatives, a national helpline, intensive treatment programs, and recovery support services. And the National Eating Disorders um, collaboration is a project which brings together research, evidence, expertise, lived experience to create a nationally consistent approach to eating disorders and shares these evidence-based materials with a wide range of audiences. Um, so just ask you to join me uh, in welcoming Francis up to the podium. Thank you. Uh, so today I'm here, I'm going to talk mostly on behalf of the NEDC, the National Eating Disorders Collaboration. I'm going to go through, this is a really introduction level to eating disorders. I'm going to go through a little bit about what eating disorders are, what it's like to have an eating disorder for a young person, how you might identify that somebody's having concerns with their eating, and where you go next uh, in terms of being able to access butterfly services, but also in terms of a whole range of professional development, the treatment programs, those types of things. I'm really happy to divert ourselves in the woods in the middle of the presentation if you guys have really burning questions, so do feel free to ask as we're going along. Okay, so first up, I just have some facts about eating disorders. I find eating disorders are an area of mental health that people have a lot of myths about, misconceptions about, or just really don't know about. So I thought I'd just go through a couple of facts and stats to sort of set the scene for us this afternoon. And my first fact is that eating disorders are diverse. You cannot tell by looking at somebody that they have an eating disorder. There is more to eating disorders than just anorexia nervosa. Anyone can get an eating disorder at any stage of their life. It happens in guys as much as it happens in girls. And symptoms and diagnosis can vary over time. So there is a really common experience for somebody to have had one type of eating disorder to go on and develop another type of eating disorder in their lifetime. So eating disorders are really diverse. But within that, when we're talking about eating disorders, we're also talking about a group of mental illnesses that have a core psychopathology. There's a couple of things that happen in common for eating disorders. And that is a significant, I think really importantly and kind of obviously, is the significant amount of distress that is occurring because of eating. There's a sense of over-evaluation of weight and shape in terms of your sense of self. Um, and the control or lack of control that you have over those on the value that you place on yourself. They lead to really intense feelings of self-hatred, self-loathing, um, a really harsh inner critic voice. And in fact, a, a kind of sense of separate voice is a way that people with an eating disorder quite commonly express their experience, that there was an inner voice. There was, the eating disorder is a certain sense of themselves that's sort of a separate part of themselves, if you like. And I think really significantly in the mental health field, eating disorders all have a really significant physical health complication, particularly when you're talking about long term. So these are the eating disorders. These are the diagnostic criteria. And I'm not actually going to spend a particular amount of time on this, just to kind of go over them in the really basic sense. So anorexia nervosa up there in the dark blue. So that's the restriction of energy intake. Has everybody heard of anorexia nervosa before? It tends to be the eating disorder that most people have had some kind of experience with or are familiar with. So basically, people are um, engaging in behaviours that are deliberately about restricting their energy intake. They have that intense fear of weight gain or a change in their shape, um, a real disturbance in body image. I'm going to go a little bit more into that later. Um, and a persistent lack of recognition of how serious um, their restriction of energy intake might be to their personal welfare. 
Over in the light blue, I think I have a pointer. No? Um, over in the light blue up the top. Um, so recurrent binge eating in terms of bulimia nervosa. Um, sorry, bulimia nervosa is down in the green at the bottom. Um, the, the titles have, have not come up on this slide. Um, so top corner is binge eating. Um, in sense of binge eating disorder. Binge eating disorder, bulimia and voice are really quite similar in terms of some of their presentations. So there's, a, there's some frequency criteria in terms of meeting diagnostic criteria for binge eating disorder. Um, and that's uh, more than once a week for more than three months in a row. Down here you'll see bulimia and voice which is recurrent binge eating. Now, when I'm talking about binge eating for both of those, I'm talking about a couple of things. First is a real sense of loss of control. I know the word binge has kind of really sort of entered our common uh, parlance about the way that we eat, but when I'm talking about binge eating, I'm talking about a really objective loss of control. Some people who have binge eating disorders of those two types describe almost a sense of blacking out, that they're not really conscious of what's happening for them in that moment. Um, and for binge eating disorder afterwards, there's a real sense of guilt and shame and the way they feel about themselves after they've had that moment of loss of control. With bulimia nervosa afterwards, there'll be some kind of compensatory behaviour. So in an attempt to mitigate those sense of feelings of loss of control and self-hatred by engaging in something that's meant to restrict um, the impact of the food that they've eaten. Lots of people know compensatory behaviours like self-induced vomiting, but you could be so compensating by over-exercising, by abusing substances. There are a whole range of things. It's about it's less about the actual activity and literally about why you're engaging in it. So you're attempting to compensate for the binging that you've engaged in. The dark green box right down the bottom there where it says OzFed, Other Specified Feeding and Eating Disorders, is a category in the diagnostic manual that's about capturing people who are having clinically significant concerns around their eating, but maybe don't meet quite all of the criteria for an eating disorder. There's some examples up there of atypical anorexia nervosa where people may be engaging in all of the behaviours, have all the thoughts and feelings, but are currently within what would be defined as a normal weight range, for example. People who are really objectively experiencing binging behaviours, but maybe this is really early intervention, it hasn't happened for more than three months, or maybe it's happening just infrequently enough to not quite meet the benchmarks for diagnosis, but is having a clinically significant impact on their life and the way that they're feeling about their life. There's a couple of other things up there, uh, a purging disorder, which is, uh, is about um, sort of having less of the sense of weight and shape and more about the way that you experience food. There are a couple of eating disorders I'm actually not going to talk about, which you might have heard of, um, but I'm not going to talk about them today because they they sit a little bit outside that trans-diagnostic view in the sense of they don't tend to have an over-evaluation of weight and shape and their control. Um, so there's a couple of things like uh, PICA, which some of you may have heard of, which is about a compulsion to eat non-food substances. Um, an avoidant restricted food intake disorder, which is about restricting your intake, but not necessarily about an over-evaluation of your weight, shape or body image. It might be due to a previous trauma in eating. Happens a lot in children who have sensory processing issues. Um, I'm not going to talk about them just because they, they do sit a little differently. You treat them differently. Um, and I'm going to kind of focus on these core ones today. Yeah. What about um, overeating? Yeah, so binge eating disorder would be defined not necessarily as overeating. Um, it's about a sense of loss of control. It is about objectively having a larger proportion of food that would be considered normal. And I mean normal in any circumstance. So it's not we all sat down to Christmas dinner and ate more than, but an objectively larger than normal. Just overeating on a regular basis, if there's not, <laughs> A psychological component that goes with that if it's not about um, an emotional regulation, if it's just about a physical need to eat, that's a physical health problem that's probably not going to respond the same way as an eating disorder might. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so my second fact is that eating disorders are common. More common than I imagine most of you think they are. So 
about 9% of the population is going to experience an eating disorder in their lifetime. 9% is not that much less than the proportion who experience asthma, to kind of put that in context for you. And it means that at the moment that, you know, at any given point in time, about 4%, 4 to 5% of the population will have an eating disorder at a moment in time. And what's that? 1.2 million Australians. 15% of females in their lifetime. So although eating disorders absolutely happen um, for anyone, we do know that being female is a genuine risk factor for developing an eating disorder. In fact, it's the second leading cause of mental health issues in young females. Um, and there's just a, so guys make up about 25% of people who are experiencing anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, about 40% of people with binge eating disorder, but we do believe that those are really dramatically underrepresented. Um, males are typically not seeking help for an eating disorder, and we are not very good at identifying an eating disorder in men. We tend to identify them as other health issues. So we believe that that's probably an underrepresentation. So that's about 1 in 11. 1 in 11 Australians will experience an eating disorder. The next one is that eating disorders are serious. They're not a lifestyle choice. They're not a diet gone too far. They have significant physical health complications, obviously mental health complications. They have an increased mortality rate. They have the highest suicide rate of all psychiatric illnesses in terms of proportion of people who have an eating disorder. In fact, Suicide is one of the main causes of mortality for a person with an eating disorder, up to 200 times greater than the general population. And some of the other things up there are just some of the other physical health consequences that can be really life-threatening. Um, gastrointestinal complaints, for bulimia nervosa, electrolyte imbalance can cause immediate cardiac events, um, severe emaciation, obviously, for somebody who's had anorexia nervosa. In fact, that's a list of some of the more common medical consequences of having an eating disorder. And I haven't got that up there because I expect you to be able to read through literally everything on the list. Partly the list is there so that you can identify just how wide reaching the complications of having an eating disorder can be. Um, all the way through from the general kind of things that you might actually be seeing in your, your work, uh, longer term gastrointestinal complaints, cardio complaints, um, and there basically isn't a system of the body that isn't affected by an eating disorder, which, you know, on the face of it really makes sense because if you are not getting the right fuel for your body, then you're going to have your physical health impacted. Then there's the costs. The Butterfly Foundation did a study with uh, Deloitte Economics a couple of years ago now that said that the, the total yearly economic cost of eating disorders, that's looking at in terms of lost productivity as well as the actual cost of treatment, was 52 billion. In fact, an eating disorder is second only to um, a heart attack in terms of the cost of inpatient treatment in Australia. And the costs happen for an individual as well, particularly because at the moment in Australia, there aren't necessarily um, wide reaching public services. Uh, so a study that we recently did with the Butterfly Foundation found that one in three people had to go into debt to fund their eating disorders treatment. Um, and 25% had to delay or stop treatment at some point um, because of the cost of treatment. So eating disorders are serious. Eating disorders are also complex. Um, I said a little bit earlier, I think uh, most people kind of have an image of anorexia nervosa, um, probably of a young woman, um, and that's just not the case at all. While there are some things that make you at higher risk of developing an eating disorder, they really can happen in absolutely anybody. And we are seeing them developing both younger and older people. Um, younger I'll talk about a little bit later because we're talking about youth mental health. But just really interesting, I think, to keep in mind that this can happen for anybody. I think the other important thing up here uh, is psychiatric comorbidity. Uh, so it says 20 to 40 percent up there will present with a comorbid diagnosis. That's a fairly conservative estimate and depending on what you're actually looking at in terms of particular comorbidity to particular eating disorder, that can be anywhere up to 70, 80 percent. Depression and anxiety, obviously really common ones. Personality disorders and obsessive compulsive disorders are the other ones that most commonly come from comorbid. Uh, 
And they're often really long-term consequences. Even once you have recovered from an eating disorder, if you've had a long-term course of an eating disorder, then you're looking at some potentially long-term health consequences. Yeah. Can talk about Yeah. Yeah, so there is um, so there is some good research on that, and no, um, eating disorders aren't self-limiting, and they don't re necessarily respond to the same types of treatment that you might provide for another mental health issue. So they need their own treatment. We're going to talk about some of the treatments that are, are proven to be effective with eating disorders, but typically you might assist in the so. One of the things that is true though, is it can be really important to address those comorbid issues in the addressing of an eating disorder. So if somebody is experiencing depression, then addressing depression with them is really important for increasing their motivation to change um, and capacity to change, which is one of those really crucial things in addressing their eating disorder. So it's not that they're completely unlinked, there's absolutely connections there, but we do know that um, just treating other mental health issues won't treat an eating disorder, yeah. So eating disorders require action. In fact, this fact and my next fact are kind of really linked to each other. Um, recovery is possible. Treatment in the first two years is the most successful. In fact, treatment in the first two to three years will significantly reduce the longevity and the physical health complications of an eating disorder. There are some modifiable risk factors in terms of prevention, um, which I'm not going to go into too much just because we've got an hour. I kind of really wanted to focus on eating disorders. There's so much. I could do a whole extra hour on how you go about preventing eating disorders. So I'm not going to go too much into that here. But recovery is possible and eating disorders are treatable, which I think is my, my last fact that I'm going to, to stop on because while pathways of journey um, are pathways of recovery journey are individual, they're unique and, and they're defined by the person. I think actually often eating disorders are seen as a, a lost cause, as something that is just, the person's going to have one. And it's really important to know that eating disorders are something that you can recover from, particularly if you engage in treatment early. And that's one of the really important things for people who are working with young people. Because the earlier that you can identify that an eating disorder is something that's going on for a person, the earlier treatment they'll get, you are the people who are most likely to be able to help them get that treatment in the first two to three years. Um, I have some stats soon that are going to show what the challenges look like in that and how late actually people often do seek treatment. Uh, so in working with young people, early identification absolutely the most important thing that you can be doing for an eating disorder. So now I'm just going to go through uh, how an eating disorder develops. I, I, that's almost um, an impossible thing to do. Eating disorders are almost like fingerprints. Your journey is going to have a whole range of different things that have resulted um, in the development of your eating disorder. But there are a couple of things that we can talk about in terms of how eating disorders develop. So we do know that there's a really complex interplay between genetics, psychology and environmental factors. In terms of genetics, in terms of biology, um, there are some really good currently large studies that Australia are involved in looking at the genetics, particularly of anorexia nervosa, although there are some studies with bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. In some of the studies in anorexia nervosa, they're suggesting that up to 70% of variants can be described by genetic variability. So there is a high genetic relationship between eating disorders. Um, eating disorders run in families, eating disorders run in twins. We're developing a picture of what those genetics look like. The other important thing for genetics with eating disorders is that it's not just about the genes that you might typically think of as being related to mental health, um, but that we're really seeing some variance in the way um, people experience things, experience things like hunger and, and satiation in that context and the genes that are related to that. Psychology, and we're going to go through a list of people who might be at risk of an eating disorder, but basically there are some personality traits that make people more prone to developing an eating disorder. People who have perfectionistic tendencies, people who um, have some obsessive compulsive uh, traits, people who have those other comorbid issues, so depression and anxiety. And then environmental factors, which is a huge range of things, but there are a couple of key ones and I'll go through them as well. The first is um, trauma particularly experience of childhood trauma. The second is dieting. And the third is body image and the way that we experience our bodies in uh, Western society um, or a whole range of cultural values that are placed on weight and shape, 
uh, that might prompt dieting, that might prompt the way you experience your body in society. That is not to say that everyone with an eating disorder has those experiences. Like I said, it's a complex interplay. Uh, there's a, a woman who's an eating disorders expert called Cynthia Bulick who comes from America and my proviso there is going to be explained shortly. But she explains this a little bit like a gun. And that is that the, the biology, the genetics are the gun, uh, the psychological predisposing factors are the bullet, and the environment is what's pulling the trigger. So you can imagine in that you could have a whole array of different experiences um, in the development of an eating disorder. No one person's gonna look the same. But there are high risk populations based on that interplay of risk factors. And the first is I've made really big because adolescence, being an adolescence is a key risk factor for the development of an eating disorder and you're all working with young people. So the median age of onset for an eating disorder is 18, but that's in terms of diagnosis. So if that's the median in terms of diagnosis, we're looking at people who are significantly younger as they start to develop disordered eating patterns, eating disorders. So we really are talking about adolescence, even childhood. Um, the youngest person to, to be admitted so far to the eating disorders ward that I know of is seven. Uh, we've had people that young calling the helpline. So we really are talking about uh, children and adolescents being a key pe uh, group who are at risk. Obviously people who are involved in occupations where their body weight and shape are related to success. Uh, so dancers, athletes, um, actors, people who are pursuing those types of things um, are obviously at a higher risk because their weight and shape and the control of those things is already tied up into a sense of self-value because the thing that they're doing, their occupation is tied up into a sense of self-value. Being female is a genuine risk factor in terms of just how prevalent we see them in women. Um, that's not to discount the experience of people who are identifying um, as other than being women, but just that it, it's still determined to be a risk factor. Anyone in key transition periods in life? This one's really important because so much of eating disorder behaviour is about control. It's about trying to gain control um, of your environment or it's about developing um, emotional regulation, coping mechanisms because you don't feel in control. And so key transition periods in life uh, are points where you can often feel out of control. And so we know that there's some biological key transitions that make you higher risk, um, puberty, um, for older age groups, uh, pregnancy and menopause, also biological transitions. Uh, but then you've also got some social transitions. We see a really significant peak in eating disorder presentations um, during transitions from primary to high school and high school to university or the workplace. Other key transitions that other people might be experiencing that are of a more personal nature, so transitions in and out of relationships, uh, development of identity, uh, those kind of, of moments in life where you might be out of control, basically. Already having low self-esteem, which I talked a little bit about um, in terms of the, the comorbidities. Having an illness, a, a diabetes and polycystic ovarian syndrome are two that have been particularly well evidenced. But in reality, what we're talking about is, is uh, particularly, so take diabetes as an example, as an illness where you are already, by your illness, required to develop quite restrictive patterns of eating um, and the way you feel about food in the way that it affects your health. And so if you have some of those other um, risk factors that we talked about in terms of gene genetics or psychological predisposing factors, then your diabetes might well be something that actually made you more prone to having an eating disorder. So we see a significantly higher proportion of people with an eating disorder with diabetes. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, a really similar one too. And one of the primary reasons there, of course, is because in primary health, one of the most common uh, treatments uh, recommended for polycystic ovarian syndrome is weight loss. So again, environmental factor, you're putting somebody on a diet when they might have already had um, some of those predisposing factors in terms of genetics. And, for the same reason, although they've been less researched, I would probably also consider some of the other illnesses that are related to food, so celiac disease, Crohn's disease, um, issues that have required you to go on a diet, basically, for a medical reason, not for an environmental reason. Um, those with family of eating, history of eating disorders, for the reasons that I just explained. Um, experiences of trauma, particularly in childhood, um, and those who are seeking weight loss treatment or dieting. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, the, the role of dieting, I don't think, can be underestimated. Um, and sometimes dieting doesn't necessarily mean something that you're voluntarily doing. It can mean something like you've had <coughs> surgery that means that you are now on a very prescribed diet um, in the same way that you have an illness that is a very prescribed diet, um, particularly because the surgeries um, aren't necessarily always good at picking up psychological issues in a, in a pre-screening and so it may be that you had a psychological, um, you know, you had an eating disorder and that's resulted in you um, being a weight that would um, meet requirements for a sleeve as well, yeah. Absolutely, dieting. So <clears throat> by dieting what I'm talking about too is, is calorie restriction. Again, when we're talking about words that we really commonly use, I mean, diet can mean just literally the things you eat. Uh, so we're talking about calorie restriction as dieting. It is one of the most significant, if not the most significant risk factor for an eating disorder. Most people who have an eating disorder will tell you it started from a period of dieting, and that includes binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa, not just anorexia nervosa. There's a little chart around the side there that sort of shows the cycle of, of dieting as a really common experience for people um, in terms of restriction, deprivation, then your body craving, um, having guilt, having met that craving and going back into a cycle. Um, weight control practices in young people predict greater weight gain. So dieting not particularly effective at meeting its needs um, in terms of weight loss is particularly effective in triggering people who might have had a predisposition to developing an eating disorder into developing an eating disorder, which is why I take a little moment to take a sidestep to talk about dieting. Some of that dieting might come, again, from the restriction that results from other factors. We talked about illnesses in terms of long-term illnesses, but I know quite a lot of young people whose eating disorder started from a period of illness when they were young, glandular fever, tonsillitis, that required having tonsils out, all of those things uh, required or naturally led to weight loss. Um, I can think of, of one young woman who has told her story publicly with us um, who went on an international exchange, got very unwell when she was over there, um, came back and got a lot of positive feedback about the weight that she had lost. Felt really good about that feedback, started to develop some patterns of behaviour that meant she could sustain that once she got home. Those patterns of behaviour started to ingrain. She really started to rely on those things for her self-value and worth and developed an eating disorder from there. What yeah. about drug use? Um, people will use drugs and they lose weight. Yep, absolutely, and it's a really, so really, really similar thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be diet, it, calorie restriction and loss of weight, really. Um, so we see two things with eating disorders. Uh, there's a high comorbidity with substance abuse um, in terms of development. So yes, if you're losing weight and, and that triggers something for you because you've been using substances, but we also see people using substances as either a restrictive or compensatory method. Um, substances and also their own medications. So diabetes is an example of that again, where people will um, misuse their insulin to, to uh, lose weight. And a really difficult one, because so often when people will present with those two issues, the eating disorder will not get looked at. They'll entirely focus on a, a substance abuse issue um, and you won't resolve the eating disorder by looking at the substance so abuse I, issue. Um, I knew the person who got lots of compliments when they looked well, when they were yeah. nice. Yeah. And they were thin and Absolutely. healthy, but when they were off it, they weren't. Yes. Yeah, no, it, and, and that absolutely, it's a huge risk factor. Um, not everybody who has a substance abuse issue is going to develop an eating disorder, but just in the same way as everybody else is doing this, if you have somebody who has other predictive factors, maybe their traumatic environment, you know, traumatic history, maybe some of those personality traits or even the genetic predisposition, and they've restricted because they've been taking a substance, it kicks off for them that pattern of that's what I want, I feel in control, I get those compliments, I get that positive feedback on yeah, the way I look, um, and I want to maintain that. Um, that makes me feel successful, yeah. So that's, that's what an eating disorder is, but I just wanted to kind of take a moment to say what it's like to have an eating disorder. Uh, a proviso up front, I'm not a neuropsychologist, so there is actually limits to the amount that I can 
talk to you about the information in this slide. But I've included it because I think it's really important in explaining the lack of choice that a person with an eating disorder has. So up the top, you'll see a, a AN standing for anorexia nervosa. So a, person, a young woman with anorexia nervosa looking at other people, then someone without anorexia nervosa looking at other people, then down the bottom you've got uh, people without looking at without anorexia nervosa looking at themselves in a mirror and a person with anorexia nervosa looking at themselves in a mirror. So this is an MRI study done in Sydney actually not that long ago. The big bits of red that you can see at the back in the three um, going around the outside there and it's largely the bit of your brain that processes visual information. When you look at the brain of a person who has anorexia nervosa looking at themselves in a mirror. There is no activity in the back of that brain. They are, for all intents and purposes, literally not seeing themselves in their brain. That is not something they are choosing. That is not about vanity. That is not about a lifestyle choice. That is about something that is going on in their brain. There is a tiny little bit of red that you can kind of see in the in the middle of that last brain there. And that is because you can see a little bit of activity. And that's generally in the bit of the brain that manages our really primal flight or fight responses. So fear responses. So for a person with anorexia nervosa looking in a mirror, they literally cannot see themselves the way you see them. They cannot objectively appraise what size they are, but they're afraid of what they're seeing. These are just some uh, quotes from uh, some people who have a lived experience of an eating disorder who've done some work with the NEDC. It's like there's a tyrant in my head screaming abuse at me 24-7. After a binge purge episode, I feel like I've been hit by a truck. There were numerous times when ending it all crossed my mind because I was just so tired. And the last one, I was recently asked to sum up my experience of anorexia nervosa in one sentence. And actually, I can do it in just one word. Isolation. You feel completely alone. But those things are tempered with some of the other things that I really frequently hear from people with an eating disorder. And that is, my eating disorder is my friend. My eating disorder is the only thing there for me. My eating disorder is the only thing I've ever been good at. So there's this real sense of the eating disorder serving a purpose, even though it is this incredibly abusive tyrant that is telling them that they are no good, that they is telling them that they are not worth it. Um, but it is also the only thing that they have found as a coping mechanism, which kind of looks a little bit like this. So there's a whole lot of things going on for a person with an eating disorder. There's the stress, this sense of starvation, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. There's the hard work. I mean, it can be really difficult to maintain behaviours of an eating disorder. Um, quite often they go against your biological urges in terms of food um, or in terms of satiation when you're binge eating. You don't do those things if you don't see a value in them. They can, you know, particularly anorexia nervosa, it is hard work to maintain those behaviours. It's important to know that because it's important to know what value this is, what value this has for the young person that you're working with. This has a value. Um, Egocentonic is a word that we often use to describe eating disorders. The behaviours are serving a purpose for the person. Um, and the other thing is, at this point, they've quite often lost what alternatives of coping might look like, what alternatives in terms of viewing themselves might look like. And so they're sort of stuck in this, this cycle of, um, this feels horrid, but this is good for me. I am good at this. This is the way that I control myself, or this is the way that I soothe myself um, when things haven't gone right, and I don't know how else to manage this. So there's a huge range, basically, of impacts of having an eating disorder. Um, we've talked about a lot of those, so the psychological, the substance use, um, depression, anxiety, suicidality. Um, the medical, obviously, all of those issues that we were looking at in terms of medical consequences of having an eating disorder. Um, the psychological and life stage things, so particularly because they happen at key, often happen at key transition periods of life, there's often a lot of isolation that goes on with having an eating disorder. There's a lot of lost opportunity. Um, when we did the study that I got the, the statistics from before about the number of people who went into debt, uh, we also found that 70% of the people who'd had an experience of an 
experience of an eating disorder said they had missed out on finishing um, some type of study or qualification as a result of their eating disorder. So fairly significant longer term life consequences. And obviously for the, the family, um, and whatever that looks like for a young person, the burden of, of care and, and development of beliefs around eating disorders. So that's eating disorders. That's what eating disorders are. That's why you might be concerned about them. The next thing I'm going to go on to looking at is how you identify them and how you go about having those conversations. But did anyone have any questions um, about any of the stuff that I've presented on what eating disorders are before I move on? Okay, so this is where I was talking a little bit about early intervention is really important. On average, it takes between seven and 10 years for somebody with an eating disorder to seek treatment. Seven to 10 years. You combine that with the treatment is most effective in the first two to three years and we have a little bit of a problem. There's a lot of reasons that we don't early detect. One of them is that egocentric nature of eating disorders that I was talking about, is the fact that it's serving that person a purpose. They're not likely to present to you and say, I have an eating disorder. Even if they're presenting to you for a whole range of other mental health issues, they're actually not likely to disclose having an eating disorder for themselves. They're likely to seek help for other issues, and that's where you will most likely find them. So there are three key things that we want to be able to do. We want to be able to observe, listen, and ask. So we want to be able to observe their physical health, observe some of the warning signs that I'm going to go through, what might be going on for them. We want to be able to listen. We want to be able to listen to their concerns and interpret some of that stuff. Because um, as I said, they're not likely to say, I haven't eaten sort of, but listen in terms of some of the other things they're saying about food, about the way that their relationship with food is progressing. But also listen to others others in their life. Um, I actually don't know a person whose story didn't involve somebody else identifying this before they identified it for themselves. Uh, so family, peers, other workers who are working with them, particularly caseworkers who might have a, a more day-to-day -day kind of relationship with somebody. If other people are concerned, it's worth looking at, even if it turns out to be not a problem. And then asking, so actually implementing some of the screening that we're going to talk about in a in a day-to-day -day context in your work. You don't know. This is the thing about eating disorders, you won't know unless you ask. I hear so often from people, I don't see people with eating disorders. And my response to that is always, that's probably because you haven't asked them. If one in 11 Australians will have an eating disorder in their lifetime, then in the course of your professional world, you will deal with people who have eating disorders. You just may not know that that's what was going on for them. Okay, so these are some warning signs. I'll say it a couple of times as we go through. Obviously not everybody who's presenting these things has an eating disorder or, or disordered eating concerns. So you're not just looking at individual things, you're looking at kind of clusters of things that might indicate for you that there's something going on. So a preoccupation with food, with eating, with weight, with shape, that preoccupation might come out in the way that they eat, it might come out in the way that they talk. Um, constantly referencing it in perhaps inappropriate um, settings, so referencing food when you were talking about something else, um, always drawing uh, praise or criticism back to their bodies or their food, the way they experience themselves that way. Feeling out of control around food, so talking about being out of control around food. Having a really distorted body image, so not seeing themselves the way others might describe them. Having really black and white thinking about foods being good or bad. No, I know that one's a really tricky one because I think we're often taught to have that as a behaviour uh, in this day and age. But having really rigid thoughts about things always being good and always being bad um, and those things imbuing those values on themselves. So I ate the bad food, therefore I am bad as a kind of relationship. Incidentally, labelling good foods good and bad, it's not a good idea and we'll talk a little bit about that soon. Using food for emotional self-regulation. So comfort, praise, also punishment, um, often in, in the denying food to yourself as a punishment, um, but using it as a stress relief um, and change, just general changes in their emotional state. I know that's one of, of so many different things that we be going on for a young person, but changes to their emotional state, uh, development of anxiety, depression, Physical health warning signs, weight loss, weight gain, or fluctuations in weight. Um, really important to remember gain there, 
Um, people who have uh, bulimia nervosa as well as binge eating disorder during the course of their illness will usually be at a higher weight um, than other periods of their life. Gastrointestinal problems, over-exercising injuries. Uh, for uh, slightly older girls, infertility issues, feeling cold regardless of the weather, fatigue, so constantly being sleepy or not sleeping well, fainting and dizziness, really common one. And again, really common, um, it, it's kind of an obvious thing to imagine, it's really common with people who are experiencing anorexia nervosa, but particularly for bulimia nervosa and even binge eating disorder, if you're not um, eating nutritionally well, um, then you're likely to be suffering poor nutrition, which has a, a significant relationship to fainting. People who've engaged in compensatory behaviours, like uh, in self-induced vomiting, are also at a really high risk for those types of uh, physical health signs. The last two there are specifically related to people who might be engaging in the uh, compensatory behaviour of self-induced vomiting. Uh, so that's swelling of the jaw particularly, uh, and bad breath and a particular type of dental wear and erosion. In fact, dentists are often one of the first um, health uh, professionals that people with an eating disorder uh, engage with and or disclose to. Then there's some of the behavioural warning signs. Again, dieting cannot be overstated. Evidence of binge eating, frequent trips to the bathroom during or shortly after meals. Obviously, if you actually know of some of the compensatory behaviours, Changes in clothing style, um, so wearing baggy clothes, wearing uh, warmer clothes than perhaps the weather would indicate. Um, that could be because you're cold, because you've lost a lot of weight. It could be because you're trying to hide um, your body. It could be related to your body esteem, those types of things. Obsessive rituals around food preparation and eating. This one's particularly true for people who are experiencing anorexia nervosa. Um, extreme sensitivity to comments about body shape, weight and eating, exercise habits, um, and I, I really mean that kind of sensitivity, that extreme sensitivity. Um, for somebody who has anorexia nervosa, um, <clears throat> even the comment that kind of says, you look well today, can be taken as, I think you've put on weight. And, and so responses to, to your language um, around their health and well-being, uh, around their body, around food, whether they've eaten or not, like a real sensitivity to those conversations. Um, and secretive behaviour, so saying they've eaten when they haven't, um, organising things around mealtime so they don't have to. I did have a client um, who I used to see, who I worked out very quickly was seeing me at lunchtime, so she didn't have to eat at lunchtime. Um, hiding uneaten food, hiding eaten food and the containers that go along with it. So that real, because that's going along with the sense of shame um, and the secrecy that they want to be developing there. Okay, few people, as I was saying, are going to acknowledge that they have an eating disorder. There are a couple of things that they're most likely to present with and the first, physical health complications. So they are most likely to present um, to a health professional um, or in talking to you about life goals or, or however that might be in whatever roles that you have um, about weight and weight management, either losing or wanting to lose. Um, and interestingly, that doesn't necessarily align with eating disorders the way you would imagine. So people with anorexia nervosa may well actually present for weight loss and, and seeking further weight loss if they're feeling that they're not being successful. Um, it's, yeah, you really can't tell. You cannot tell by looking at somebody that they have an eating disorder. Um, I, I think a really common example is people who would meet the diagnostic criteria I was talking about earlier for OSFET, other specified feeding and eating disorders. Um, I know of a guy who presented to his GP having lost 40% of his body weight in five months, um, but he had been at a significantly higher BMI than the government says is, is good. Um, and so what he actually got was a really a huge amount of positive feedback on his weight loss um, because that's what we teach people to do and because he wasn't yet presenting as somebody that you would imagine in, in that kind of myth belief has an eating disorder, has anorexia nervosa because he was still at a reasonably large size at that point. Um, he's actually just finished inpatient treatment 
for anorexia nervosa because those behaviours weren't resolved um, by losing a particular portion of weight. It wasn't something he could control. But there was this whole period of, of his life where he had definitely developed an eating disorder, but he didn't fit a kind of physical mould that people assumed would be related to an eating disorder. And he never presented for an eating disorder. He presented because he wanted to know how he could sustain his weight loss because he developed some gastrointestinal complaints related to how quickly he'd lost his weight. Um, and he had developed some palpitations around his heart. Um, and those were the things that were addressed. Nobody asked him what his eating looked like. So the, really, the biggest thing, the thing you need to do, the thing you kind of need to remember out of all of this is ask, is to ask questions. If you think about those things um, that we just talked about in terms of behaviours, in terms of the way things are looking for them with risk factors, you know, if they're meeting a lot of those risk factors and now you think you're a bit concerned about the way they're eating, um, it's really important to ask questions in the same way that you would if you're assessing somebody and you might ask questions about smoking or drug use, uh, if you have some concerns around eating, um, or if you're doing a general um, psychological intake assessment, it is really important to ask questions around food and around eating behaviours. There's a couple of examples up there, so people with depression, people with anxiety, and just a couple of statistics. So patients with eating disorders present to their GP significantly more than people without an eating disorder, but for non-eating disorder related problems. <coughs> in binge eating, uh, bulimia nervosa, there's an average of seven years between the initial physical health presentation and the diagnosis of an eating disorder. First two to three years when treatment is most effective. By the time you've had an eating disorder for seven years, you have some really significantly ingrained behaviours. It's really serving a purpose in your life, but you've also developed some really significant physical health complications that are going to outlast your eating disorder even if you um, journey into recovery. So we want to be able to stop that. The other really interesting one, the stat down the bottom there, is a study that was recently done by the Centre for Clinical Interventions in Western Australia, where out of, so they run an eating disorders clinic. Um, that people get referred to. They also run a generalist depression and anxiety clinic. And so they actually started to screen all of the people presenting to the depression and anxiety clinic for an eating disorder. Um, and what they found is 20% met the probable criteria. They would have needed some more information from that person at the time of assessment to make a determination. And 7%, 7.3% met during that assess initial assessment the diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder. They weren't there for an eating disorder. They weren't there because they had concerns about their eating. They were just presenting to a depression clinic. So they're a lot more prevalent. It's not because they're not there. It's because we don't ask. And we do have opportunities to identify these things when people present, like that group of people who are presenting to the depression and anxiety clinic. So there's a couple of screening things uh, that have really quite good evidence in terms of highlighting eating disorders. And I like them because they're really simple. They're really easy to implement, even if you're not a person who does diagnostic testing um, or uh, working in a psychological field, you can implement them in any work that you do. They sound naff that you need to be able to work with them um, in a way that means that a young person is going to engage with you. But these are the way that they've been written and, and tested and assessed. So many people have concerns about food and weight. Do you have any concerns or worries about these things? Uh, many people have trouble with eating too much. Has this ever been a problem for you? Really interestingly on that second one, um, that's not just about binge eating. That's about looking at a whole range of people's feelings about food. Um, and people who are experiencing anorexia nervosa may also feel that they have trouble with eating too much. Then there's two questions that have um, been particularly studied in relation to bulimia nervosa. Are you satisfied with your eating patterns? And do you eat in secret? A whole bunch of these um, tools are actually available on the NEDC website, nedc.com.au, in case you're madly trying to write down content. So this screening tool is probably currently the best for all broad eating disorders. There's a couple for specific eating disorders. It's called SCOFF. I'm so sorry. Um, I didn't come up with it. Um, it's actually from England. Uh, but it's a really useful tool, easy because it's five questions. Uh, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Do you worry that you've lost control over how much you eat? Have you recently lost over six kilos in a three months period? Do you believe yourself to be fat when others say you're too thin? And would you say food dominates your life? 
And look, that's not a diagnostic test for an eating disorder, but if somebody is saying yes to two or more of those questions, that is a good indicator that you need to be doing further assessment. In fact, it picks up about 70 to 80 percent of people who go on to have a diagnosis of an eating disorder. If there were any question though that you were looking to use rather than using the whole tool, then I think that last one really goes to the, to the heart of what you're trying to ask. Would you say food dominates your life? I'm not going to go into these in any great detail, but just for anybody who might work in this particular area or is interested, there are some really good clinical diagnostic tools for assessment in eating disorders. Um, the top one, obviously the HEADS psychological assessment as well. Um, includes questions about eating, but the little list at the top, the ADEQ is the one that we use most commonly in all of our programs for eating disorders. Um, you can find that list on the NEDC website too, just if you work in an area where you might be looking to do some further assessment or understand what might happen for somebody that you're working with when they get referred. So one of the most important things I think when we're working with people who have an eating disorder or we might be worried about having an eating disorder is the assessment of risk. I really go back to what I was saying about a person having um, up to 200 times uh, suicide risk to the general population and say that you should be doing uh, risk assessment if you're worried about somebody having an eating disorder. So this little box is just about all the things that you might consider. You might do all of those things or you might just do a tiny part of this and be thinking about who you should be referring this person to to have other things done. So obviously you're doing a self-harm and suicide assessment, risk assessment. You're looking at comorbid conditions and whether there's any assessment that needs to happen in relation to that. Um, and you're using the diagnostic tools um, that I was just talking about in terms of getting an actual diagnosis for an eating disorder. The Royal Australia College um, of Psychiatry, Australia and New Zealand College of Psychiatry, produced some really good admission guidelines for eating disorders. So um, particularly relevant to anorexia nervosa, but also relevant for bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder, which is about at what point is somebody at significant enough risk that um, admission to a hospital is important um, and whether that admission should be medical or psychological. They're all in those guidelines, uh, really easy, free to access on the internet, uh, useful whether you're going to use them or whether you also actually need to be talking to a medical professional on a young person's behalf on what kind of assessment they need to be doing. Um, they will also include, so I've written GP assessment because a GP is a really important person in this team um, to be talking to a young person, to be looking at all of those um, there's ECG, so things about the heart, things about electrolytes, um, they're all in the admission guidelines as well. Uh, general things that everybody can be aware of, weight, height and temperature, so body temperature, and then behavioural. So there are a couple of things that might indicate significant risk in terms of behaviours for eating disorders. Um, the severity and frequency behave of behaviours, so how often are they doing something. I don't know whether any of you saw, but there was a recent coroner's inquest into the death of um, a lovely young woman who, who passed away in South Australia, um, who was engaging in taking laxatives 100 times a day. Uh, so when you're looking at severity and frequency of behaviours, obviously there are some behaviours which done more frequently um, or more intensely would produce a significant risk and need for medical intervention. Um, what their current food intake is. So when you're looking at risk assessment, you're asking them questions like, particularly for anorexia nervosa, what time, when, when did you last eat? What did that look like? Uh, for someone with binge eating or bulimia, it might be what does a regular day eating look like for you? What did yesterday's eating look like for you? And then refusal for treatment, because that's a significant risk sign for a person with an eating disorder that they're um, not particularly in control for themselves right now, that the eating disorder is very strong. Um, if they have absolutely no inclination uh, to be engaging with you or talking about their eating disorder or getting further assessment that might indicate that they're at a higher risk at the moment. Just going to take a little side step when we're talking about risk to just talk about the impact of uh, starvation because actually the impact of starvation on people looks really similar to some of the presentations of anorexia nervosa so it's kind of important to understand where this, this risk and these behaviours have come from. Has anybody heard of the, the Keys or um, Minnesota study done, I can say a couple of nods, was um, it was published in 1950, but it was uh, developed around uh, the Second World War. It was a study into what starvation looked like um, and how you could 
reasonably produce rations for, for people. So they took a group of otherwise physically and psychologically healthy adult men, put them on a calorie restricted starvation diet, things you couldn't do with human ethics approval these days. Um, and as a complete aside, the, the calorie restriction they put them on is what Women's Day would probably tell you these days was the maximum you should eat. Um, but what was really interesting, what was really interesting is these psychologically and physically healthy men, when put on a calorie restricted diet, started to produce all of these symptoms, an overwhelming preoccupation with food. These 1950s, 1940s men were collecting recipes, they were sharing cookbooks, they were purchasing their own cooking materials. They got really ritualistic about eating, about the way they ate food on a plate, about who they ate it with. They developed significant personality and, and psychological changes. They developed depression and anxiety. Their libido decreased, they became withdrawn, they became isolated. They had really impaired problem solving um, and that really impaired uh, sort of capacity to make decisions particularly about themselves and when you think about all those things that sounds like a person that we often describe as having anorexia nervosa so there's a lot that goes on in a person who's been starved that starvation might also actually be related to the way that you're engaging in your nutrition so people with bulimia nervosa or even binge eating disorder depending on how they're engaging in their eating um, just no matter what their weight might also actually be experiencing some nutritional starvation. What was really interesting with that study though was that most of those men returned to normal after they stopped the study, but some of them developed really lifelong psychological consequences that looked an awful lot like an eating disorder. So, that's eating disorders, that's what we know that they are, that's what it might look like if we screen for them. So, we screen for them now we're having a conversation about them. What does that look like? And what might a person's responses be? So understanding how a young person might respond to you when you've done that screening, when you've asked some questions, and where that might come from. Because quite often what you might get from them is hostility, um, is a, a kind of minimization of the issue. And that can be related to that ambivalence, to that sense of um, this is serving me a purpose and I don't want to let this go and I, 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 you know, I need this, this is an important part to me, this is my only friend. Um, belief in the myths about eating and eating disorder, you know, for some people it may not even be that they've identified that this isn't how you have an appropriate and healthy, mindful relationship with food. You know, I'm supposed to be on a diet. Um, I'm supposed to be doing this thing. Everybody says that this is what's supposed to be happening for me. So it might be that they haven't even realized what that looks like. Um, but the other thing that you may well get is relief. They've been carrying this thing, and particularly when you're talking about bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder, they've probably had a huge amount of stigma, they haven't wanted to talk about it with somebody, and that somebody has asked and opened that window. I see this all the time, and certainly the other clinicians that I work with say they quite often see a sense of relief, that somebody has asked that this is now a person that I can unload this to. But that's how you might see them responding. Question is next, how do you respond? There's a, a couple of ways that we see as really common. Uh, we actually uh, use these particular analogies uh, with carers, but I think they're really apt for professionals as well. So there are a couple of responses that we see that are so common. And the first is sit down, start eating, or stop doing that. We're going to do this. You're going to have to do that. I don't get what's going on for you, right? Like we're just, we are gonna make this work. I'm gonna do this. okay, that's fine, we'll put it over there. Let's talk about the depression that I understood. Let's go more into this. I, I can't see the eating disorder, we'll just, we'll make that work and, and we'll address that by addressing these other things. I have to protect you from literally everything in life. You are no longer allowed to make any decisions. I'm going to be carrying you around and everything will be fine as long as I am in control of you. None of those things are particularly helpful, full stop, right? But particularly with eating disorders, we, yeah. Yeah. I have a daughter who is, so yeah. everything is so, especially that last week, so two, it's like two men's buddies. Yeah. <laughs> but also from a professional perspective too, so I've got a bit of a yeah. 
No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> I'm glad it resonates for you though. It's because it, it's so, I mean, these are so normal reactions, right? Like it's not, this is, this is not about the right and wrong way to do this. This is how, this is just a really good explanation of how some of our either personality or professional traits result in us responding to eating disorders, particularly eating disorders, because we do have these responses to people. What we're really looking for is a skilled helper, and somebody who can align with the person, who can talk warmly with them, who can make this an okay and safe space with them and give them choice in a situation where that's possible and dignity in making their own decisions. The kangaroo can often feel like the best response for a person with an eating disorder, but it's still actually not particularly helpful in terms of helping them developing coping strategies and developing ways that they can engage with life. It's really just replacing the eating disorder with another coping strategy that's not particularly effective. Um, the image that's used in this work with carers is actually a dolphin, although if anybody's into marine biology, I get that dolphins aren't necessarily always the best communicators and, and community you know, engages, but in theory that's what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody who doesn't judge, who is a safe space to listen, particularly because, and I get that this is a really common thing around all mental health, but there is a lot of stigma, even in mental health professions, around eating disorders. And the best thing that you can do in that first interaction is really be non-judgmental and warm and say, this is a serious thing and you're going to need help to get better, but it's okay and somebody will help you. It's really not a good idea to motivate through fear and stigma. Um, with eating disorders, there can, like, there can be a sense of wanting to do that. You know, if you don't do this with me, I'm sending you to hospital. Um, if you don't do this with me, you're gonna die. And those things are true quite often, but they're often not particularly effective in developing a collaborative relationship. And what we're talking about here very much is that initial communication, is developing that relationship with a person with an eating disorder that's gonna take them forwards. And maybe longer term down that line, you will be having those kind of really abrupt conversations, but this is about the way that you initially engage with someone. You wanna avoid details of eating behaviours and anthropomorphic measurements, at least in that first conversation. And again, something that probably sounds so counterintuitive, you instantly want to kind of make the conversation all about what behaviour they engaged in yesterday, how much they ate, what calories did that look like. But the thing is, particularly in those first conversations, that's not what this is about. This is a really common kind of saying in, in the treatment of eating disorders that they're about the food, but they're not about the food. This is not about the food. The f way that they're engaging in these behaviours is about meeting another need for them. And you want to focus on how they are, about what's going on for them, what this feels like. And you're kind of focusing on those coping, you know, this is, if this is a coping strategy, what are they coping with? What's going on for them outside of that? You want to start with that. You want to use really neutral language around food, weight and shape wherever possible. You don't want to normalise or glamorise. When I say normalise, I don't mean saying other people experience this too, this is okay, but I mean saying it doesn't matter, it's a normal thing, everybody does dieting, everybody does things like that. Avoid diagnostic labels unless you're currently in the process of diagnosing someone, they're not that helpful. Um, and offer choice and dignity within safe boundaries in whatever that looks like for you. Um, I've, you know, I've been involved with young people where we were having to um, have them put into hospital and that wasn't something that they wanted. But we went through the whole process of, of how did they want to get there, what was the choice about what transport they used, all those types of things. So really what you're doing is looking at three things in whatever conversation that you have with people. You are looking at recognition, resilience and help seeking. So when you're talking to people, you want to know, are you helping them to recognise that something's going on for them? Are you helping them to see that the eating disorder is not actually the coping strategy that they thought they were? That perhaps they have an issue with binge eating? That perhaps there's something else going on for them? You want to be able to promote resilience in them, helping them to see other coping mechanisms that might be available to them, help them to see other values that they might have outside of their weight and shape. Or are you helping them to seek help? Whether that be actually through you if you're a provider of, of treatment for an eating disorder or whether it's about engaging them to find specialist care and things like that. Okay. All right. Um, a whole range of these things are similar themes on what I've just been talking about in terms of positive messaging, what communication looks like, um, some really helpful things um, and less helpful things. So really helpfully, basically, 
Compliment on non-appearance related attributes. Help them to see the other positive things that they have. Be a positive role model in terms of the way that you talk. Don't talk at work um, negatively about your own weight and shape and your diet and your behaviours. And then the essential elements of care. But one of the things that, so there's a whole range of things that primary care interventions can do, can be a part of. Um, lots of those lists of things that you might already be doing, um, maybe not necessarily with eating disorders management. One of the things that I think is most useful to know when you work in a, a generalist youth health service is that there are a couple of really good guided self-help manualised programs that have a really high success rate for bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder when done early and they are highly manualised, they can be implemented without significant psychological training, further training in eating disorders, you can go through them together. Um, they're a really useful tool in the arsenal of somebody who's working in a general community setting who may not necessarily have um, the tools and experience to go on in an in-depth concept. Um, the details of them are on the NEDC website, so I really encourage you to look them up. So what you've identified is an issue common to all services. The dosage for eating disorders is higher than you commonly find in any system, so it's higher than the Medicare rebate for sessions. Um, it's somewhere between 20 and 50 sessions a year. Um, 20 to 25 sessions of uh, cognitive behavioural therapy is considered a dose um, for anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa. The programs that I'm talking about though, one of the reasons that we talk about a lot about long term is the difference between when a person's first identified and doing early intervention. So one of the reasons that eating disorders currently have such a long term course of illness is because most of those people have had an eating disorder for a decade before they seek help. So one of the things about trying to do this in a, an, a youth setting is to actually be catching it in that first two to three years, which is when things like these guided self-help programs have the most evidence for being effective. So if you uh, engage, like, so guided self-help would even be appropriate for people who were perhaps developing disordered behaviours, didn't necessarily meet all the criteria for an eating disorder yet, those types of things. Um, so you really, have a, a cost benefit to be delivering early on. We are actually currently working with Medicare to review um, how much treatment a person with an eating disorder is supported in getting for that reason though. Particularly because there's a lot of stigma and, and myth belief that goes around having that. Um, but what, probably what I take from, from what you were saying earlier that's really important that kind of also goes back to what you were saying is um, a team approach is really important with an eating disorder. You can't just be a one therapist who's doing eating disorders. At the very least they're going to need a GP, um, probably a dietitian or some kind of nutrition intervention. There are also other lower level intensities um, that are around that can provide positive supports um, and I probably, because I know we're getting to the end, we'll skip through to what that looks like because I think that's the most fundamental one for you. So the Butterfly Foundation runs a national helpline. That includes online support programs. There's an online care or psych education program. Um, families can't be underestimated as a part of a treatment team in whatever family looks like. I've done really good work with um, some res care teams um, in being the family support for family-based therapy um, for eating disorders. So you find that support, you look at what long-term does, and you look at what long-term does in terms of maintenance for that person too. It might be that there's a peer support program that's really effective for them once they've gone through 20 sessions of, of CBTE or something that then can also be your touch point for getting back into a system if something's not going right for them. So the helpline is open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to midnight. It's available for anyone to call. A young person who's having an issue can call, they can use the web chat that's available from the website, they can email, um, they can get, so the, the program also runs some brief intervention, for, particularly for people who might be currently waiting um, to access the service. But you can also call it as a professional. You can get advice on whether something is or isn't an eating disorder, whether there's something that you should be doing, where you can get further information. They have an entirely Australian-wide database, so you can um, get referrals for clients. They can also call themselves and find referrals in their local area or some advice on what to do if there aren't referrals in their area. Okay, that's me. <laughs> Fantastic.